Hello everyone, my name's Gary Nelson and I'm the Cornell Local Roads Program Instructor for the Asphalt Paving Principles and Pavement Maintenance Workshops. Today I'm going to talk about paving from a practitioner's perspective. This video was a companion to the July 21st CLRP webinar titled Paving from the Engineer's Perspective given by David Orr. In 2018, myself and the Cornell team rewrote the Asphalt Paving Principles Manual, and nearly all the concepts presented here are fleshed out in greater detail in that publication. We are not gonna talk about things like gallons per square yard of tack coat or screed RPMs or how to calculate uh, compaction density of the mat. What we are gonna do is break down each of nine different topics into three or four bits of what we feel are usable, practical, uh, basic pieces of information. Nearly everything here relates to something I've learned or observed over the last 40 some years working with asphalt. Everything shown, I've seen the benefits of or the detriments of not doing several to numerous times over the past 40 years. Okay, so for today, it's assumed that all proper due diligence has been done on your project. You either have a contract out or you have a schedule and it's determined that hot mix asphalt is the chosen option, whether it's maintenance or new construction. Okay, so let's get paving. Get started here. Okay, asphalt paving, a practitioner's perspective. And here's the nine steps we're gonna talk about. The first three are going to be done before the paver is even started or even before it hits the job. Choose the right mix, determine the methods, conduct a pre-paved meeting. Then we're gonna look at a few paver do's and don'ts, a few roller do's and don'ts. Um, some of the methods we're gonna talk about are tack coat, joint construction, and compaction. Then we'll talk about why weather matters okay so we're just going to go right into it choosing the right mix options in new york super paver standard uh you can see the old standard mixes and the super paved counterparts they are more similar than they were when super pay first came out not, uh, 20 to 25 years ago i'm well aware of that i was on a committee that that um wrote the changes as far as the asphalt grade, regardless of which type of mix you use, standard or super pave, most likely you're gonna use straight asphalt, which upstate is PG64 S22. 95 to 98% of your roads are fine with that asphalt. Modified, uh, most likely polymer modified, typically PG64 V22 upstate using high traffic areas, heavy intersections, or, or maybe that Walmart distribution center is being put in your town and you're gonna see a heavy influx of trucks. Um, you may wanna go with the modified grade, the upgrade. Why modify? Rutting is preventable, guys. That's one of the main things that happens with asphalt in the heat and um, I started using polymers back in 1975 on the Peace Bridge in Buffalo because it was rutting. We had it on tool barriers. You can stop rutting using the proper grade of asphalt in heavy situations. One critical thing to be aware of is with any mix, make sure you let the mix cool at intersections before you put traffic on it or else it's going to corrugate. You want to get down below, maybe below 150 degrees or even lower. Another thing, choosing the right mix, thickness matters. Rule of thumb, three times the nominal size of the aggregate. Do not lay a 6F or 12 and a half millimeter mix, which has half inch aggregate, at three quarter inches. That's what happened here, and you can see the raveling. This is literally, they just did a little center lane with 6F, and um, this is literally 500 yards from my house. Determine the methods. 
Are you going to use TAC coat? Um, yes or no, we highly recommend. That's why we have it in asterisks. And we're going to talk more about this later. Joint construction, more on this later. We're, we're going to highlight the traditional butt joint um, because it's the least expensive option. Traffic control, how can you keep the area safe? Do we need to prevent traffic getting on the pavement too soon? What about compaction techniques? Are we going to monitor with the gauge? Most likely not. But if not, what else can we do? Again, more on this later. All of these things could be discussed with either your crew or put in contract at a prepaid meeting. You already have the contract. Uh, we highly recommend prepaid meeting. Have the paving contractor there or your crew. Have the material supplier there. Um, and who's going to supervise the project? Who's going to oversee it and make sure the methods that were chosen are actually being done? Can she or he handle the job? Develop your paving plan. Confirm the mix types and methods. I mean, God forbid you get the wrong mix on a, on a project. And assign responsibilities. Um, assign responsibilities is very critical. Who's going to call the TACO truck? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? One example I distinctly remember, um, it was a project that required a nuclear gauge. Uh, paving cannot proceed in the absence of a gauge. For some reason, no prepaved meeting was conducted and nobody was assigned to call the testing agency to get the man and the gauge on the project. Result, project was delayed four hours wasted money on an idle paving crew and trucking back charges you do not want the paving crew sitting idle you might your money is going to float away in the breeze what about around the paver this is a difficult one try to match the paver speed to material delivery and keep the paver moving starting and stop is not going to get you a smooth road and we're gonna see even worse things at a stop paver in a few moments. This is not an easy task, but it's worth at least thinking about and striving for. The old, old saying, if you don't throw a dart, you never hit the target. So if you don't try to plan and try to keep the paver moving, it's not gonna happen. One suggestion, scheduling to assure steady material flow. Call your material supplier. Maybe you can pave on days they aren't busy, a day when they're not supplying that big DOT or throughway job. Um, it's unfortunate, but on a lot of those big jobs, there's penalty and uh, bonus incentives and disincentives. So there's a financial aspect to it. Unfortunately, I can guarantee you're not gonna be their top priority that day. So if you do get a day, when a plant's empty, you know you can get um, maybe a free flow of material, hire a few extra trucks, maybe borrow a few from your neighbor, try to keep the paver rolling. Steady flow equals smoother road. Maintain proper head of material in the chamber. Um, you can see here, it's about midway at the auger shaft level, which is pretty much recommended. You could be a little higher, you could be a little lower. The main goal is to keep it consistent. A screed is heavy. If the material in the chamber lessens, the material gravity will take it down. Um, conversely, uh, material is heavy. If the chamber is full, the, the screed is gonna butt up against it and wanna rise. So basically, Try to keep the uh, head of material level consistent because the screed will react to change. Many mixed types, dumping of the wings between each load when the hopper is empty creates a telltale crescent shaped segregation spot. You can see it in the, in the photo. Um, I've seen jobs where if it's top, you know, Every 200, 150 feet, 
boom, 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 there's that chevron pattern. One suggestion we talk about in our workshops, because you got to move the material at some point, it'll harden, is maybe after every four or five loads, dump the hopper. Um, and, you know, when it's still partially full, or maybe when another load is coming on top of it. But don't do it after every load and let the hopper get empty. What about the trucks? Don't stop the paver every time and allow the truck to back into it and bump it. You're gonna get a bump. Also, don't dribble the material into the hopper. Um, you'll get the coarser particles rolling down first, there'll be segregation. Raise the bed and allow the load to break, okay? This point, we're gonna look at a little video to show a few of those little concepts that we just talked about. Okay, here we are backing into the paver. Guys, I've seen that 50 times, 100 times, maybe more. And you will get a bump there. If it's automated, the screen may try to react, and then you may get a slight dip afterward. Going downhill, careful on the brakes. Can be done. And here's here is a way to do it. The truck is stopped. The paver is rolling up slowly, still moving. The roller gently taps the truck, and away they go. Next, we're gonna show the dumping. He's bringing the load up, up, up. He's not dribbling. Boom, there you go, the load breaks. Filling the hopper and the paver, as you can see, is moving along steadily. Okay, let's continue with the slides. Roller, just a few minor roller do's and don'ts. Maintain the spray bars and scraper. You do not want a dry, dry drum, material build on it. Hard to get off. What about vibratory? General consensus. First of all, make sure it's working properly. General consensus for mixed compaction, high frequency, low amplitude is the best bet. We'll talk more about compaction techniques with the roller later. Another minor thing, um, stop the vibratory before ending the pass, drift into the stop, slowly turn the roller at the end of the pass, back out slowly in reverse and begin the vibratory again when you're up to speed. Just some basic concepts, folks. Why tack coat matters? Take a look at the upper left. There's an inch and a half mat they put chalk stripes on. Then the roller moved to the left. You could see the mat moved. It rolled back, did not come all the way back. Then he rolled left again. And those are quarters. So you could see you had at least two inches of movement. And tack coat will help prevent that. So tack coat allows the mat to stay put during initial rolling thus helping compaction effort. I mean, it takes a while for the hot mat to, to um, heat and adhere to the existing surfaces. Um, so it helps mitigate future slippage cracks. DOT now requires tack coat between all layers, even on new construction. What about joints? How can we prevent this? Wedge joints an allowable method. Uh, DOT now requires joint sealant uh, before the second pass is laid. Um, but a wedge joint requires a tool to be put on your paver. Takes a little bit of effort. Joint sealant, uh, it's expensive and time consuming. So what can we do 
with the traditional butt joint method in order to prevent this from occurring. Take a look here. Here's the original compacted mat, and here's the fresh hot material. There's a good inch, inch and a half overlap. We like inch and a half. This edge of the cold mat is not as compacted as the center. So it's what we want to do is allow heat to hit that edge from the side and the top. Okay, so we want that that edge heated up first. We're going to show another little video to show um, to show this. Bear with me for a moment. Okay, the other video is ready. And you can see the overlap already. He's just budding the overlap. He is not striking it off all the way. You don't want to do that. Here comes the roller. He doesn't roll it right away. He could let it heat a little longer. I'll, gi I'll give him that. But here he comes back. And he's pressing the hot mat onto and into the existing pavement. Okay. Let's get back to the slides. So video review number one. So the proper overlap of the fresh hot material allowed the fresh material to heat the compacted edge a bit. Again, it could have been a little longer. He did not strike off the fresh material. Typically when you strike it off, you, you, you create an even line and that's bad, we'll show you in a moment. And he rolled the fresh material onto and into the somewhat less dense, already compacted edge. The Riker if the raker strikes off all the fresh hot material, a bridge will be created right at the orange arrow. This is the hard surface. Typically when they strike it off, they push it all the way and the hard surface is now level with the hot mat. Therefore, the roller drum right here is going to straddle the hot mat in this area here, and it's not going to be compacted because the hot edge is going to hold up the roller. So that's why you typically see this. So if you can do your joint that way, give it a try. See if it helps. I believe it will. I've seen it. Rollers have enough for the job. Paving 700 tons at three inches, you're going to cover about 38,000 square feet that day. So let's say you're paving top at an inch. You're going to cover same amount of tons, but you're going to cover 113,000 square feet. So the old theory of, oh, yeah, we just need one roller. Well, what are you really doing that day? Think about it. Are you doing a designated number of passes or monitoring with the gauge? Again, most of your projects are gonna be a designated number of passes. Have a plan, should be developed by an experienced operator, guy who has done it in the past. Stick to the plan unless difficulties occur. They usually do, adjust if necessary, and pay attention to the mat temperature. With the gauge, the monitoring plan is usually laid out in a contract every so many feet or yards or what have you. An experienced gauge operator can and should direct the rolling operations and adjust based on the gauge readings. And once again, pay attention to mat temperature. Why do we want to do that? Here you go. Initial breakdown rolling should occur nearly immediately at the temperature shown. Mix is going to come in maybe 320, 300. They can get a breakdown rolling right away. Then in the intermediate rolling period, that's what we call the tender zone. Here it's showing it at 200 to 275 degrees right here. Um, it could be 215 to 260. It could be 210 to 280. 
but there is a period when the mat is going to walk on you. Patience is required. Patience is required at that point. And then finished rolling can occur as low as 150 degrees. Oftentimes, um, you want to be in static mode at this point. You don't want to dislodge the mix as it's stiffening. So what can you do? Again, most of your projects, you are not going to be using a gauge. Get a thermometer. Get an infrared thermometer or get a surface thermometer. They're not terribly expensive. Uh, and you can do several things. You can confirm that the mat is in the tender zone. Maybe your operator saying the mix is walking all over the place. You check it, it's 250, you tell them to back off a bit. You could also direct the roller um, when to pick up the pace again. Hey guys, we're getting down towards 200, come on back. Can also uh, know when to switch to static mode if the temperature gets below 200. Again, it, you can get compaction as low as 160, but watch the vibratory, especially high amplitude. This is what happens with rolling passes. You do reach a peak and you can overroll. If you're down here and the mix has stiffened, maybe you're at 170, 180 degrees, the mix is stiffened, and then you come in and bang it pretty hard with the vibratory, you're going to dislodge the material and um, all the good work you did, you're going to lose. So, why weather matters? Too early in the spring, it's cold. Um, fresh map probably won't bond to the existing surface if tack coat's not used, therefore allowing slippage cracks, corrugations. Um, also, the mat may cool too quickly, affecting your compaction efforts. So, potentially poor bond and poor compaction. In the fall, a couple other issues. If the mat is too cold, um, even though the paving crew says, geez, it was a warm and sunny day, see the previous slide. Also, a couple things. Hot mix density specs are designed to allow additional compaction with traffic and warm weather. And this is not going to occur. But let's say you pave mid-November and, you know, oh, yeah, it's a warm and sunny day. It was beautiful. But the next four months are 27 degrees. You're not going to get that, that additional um, compaction with the warm weather and traffic. DOT now allows late season paving under warranty. It's a two-year warranty. They started this a while ago. I can't remember exactly when, sometime in the 2000s. Um, they did a study. The initial study showed that of those paved late in the season under the warranty, greater than 50% needed some remedial work after the two-year period. So that's something to think about. Okay, guys, there's the nine steps. Choose the right mix, determine the methods, conduct a pre-paved meeting before uh, the paver even starts. A couple basic paver do's and don'ts, a couple basic roller do's and don'ts. We looked at a few methods that can be talked about and uh, incorporated into your project. And then we talked a bit about why weather matters. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Cornell Local Roads Program.